Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session titled Ukraine and Nuclear War Risk with Seth Baum. I'm Nikki, and I'll be the MC for this session. So following Seth's presentation, we'll move to a live Q&A session where he will respond to your questions. You can submit questions to the Swap Card live discussion feature, and then after about 45 minutes, we'll bring the session to an end. For now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this session. Seth is the co-founder and executive director of the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute. He is an interdisciplinary researcher working across a wide range of fields in natural and social science, engineering, philosophy, and policy. Let's give it up for Seth. Thank you for the kind introduction. Very happy to be here at this event. The Global Catastrophic Risk Institute has, uh, from the beginning, been an organization based on uh, remote interaction. The story there is uh, the co-founder, Tony Barrett, and myself, he lived in Washington, D.C. I lived in New York City. Neither of us was really in a position to relocate, so we just decided to not relocate and have the organization based on remote interaction. With that in mind, it's really exciting to be here at the, the virtual event and have conversations with people all around the world. It's been a great so, uh, event so far, and uh, I look forward to continuing the discussion. I'll also add, at the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute, our work cuts across the full range of global catastrophic risks. We will be speaking today mostly about the risk of nuclear war, but I would note that uh, this conference is also of interest to me uh, with my climate change hat on. The amount of greenhouse gas emissions that would take to fly everybody around the world to gather in person for an event like this is actually very, very large. It, um, <clears throat> It takes a lot of energy to get airplanes into the sky and, and fly people around the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so with that in mind, very happy to have this uh, this virtual event. So um, let's uh, let's go ahead and shift over to the conversation about Ukraine and nuclear war. I'd like to start by uh, providing some background context, setting the scene for the events that, that we see today. I think this is important context uh, for everybody to, to be up to speed with in order to understand the situation as it's unfolding right now. Let's start in the early 2010s. At that point, Ukraine was deciding whether to orient its economy to the West uh, with the European Union or to the East with the Eurasian Customs Union, which was uh, which is led by Russia. The Ukraine had uh, initiated an agreement to uh, join the European Union and was in the process of proceeding on that when uh, late into the process, their president, Viktor Yanukovych, made the decision to uh, switch out of that and instead join the Eurasian Customs Union. That move sparked large protests across the country, the, the so-called Euromaidan protests named after uh, the European Union and the uh, Maidan Square in, in Kyiv, which was the epicenter of the protests. And <clears throat> those uh, protests escalated and there was uh, a conflict between the protesters and the government that led to a loss of support for President Yanukovych and he was um, uh, removed from office and went into exile. At that point, a more uh, pro-European government came into power. Now, at the same time, uh, Russia, this was when in, uh, in 2014, it was at this point that Russia annexed the uh, territory of Crimea. This was done with relatively little violence, especially compared to what we are seeing uh, right now. And this uh, was essentially because Ukraine did not uh, respond with the same sort of military uh, uh, pushback that we're seeing in the country right now. And uh, would they uh, would they have pushed back if if the country was not going through the domestic turmoil that it had been? Perhaps Russia was just being opportun opportunistic and seizing the moment. Um, it's also worth uh, emphasizing that in Crimea is the uh, Sevastopol port that is a, a very important Russian uh, 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 naval base. And so Crimea holds uh, a special significance for Russia. However, uh, they did not stop with Crimea. 
they uh, then proceeded to support a separatist movement in the Donbass region of, of eastern Ukraine. And that uh, conflict in Donbass persisted uh, from 2014 until, well, in 2021, about a year and a half ago, Russia began to uh, mobilize a large amount of uh, uh, military forces uh, around the border with Ukraine. And that led to a lot of speculation about exactly what uh, would it, what would happen. Would Russia invade? And if so, what would it be pursuing with its invasion? Would they be trying to shore up uh, support for the separatists in the Donbass region? Or would they be trying to make a play for the entire country? This was a matter of a lot of debate at the time. And uh, there was also a lot of expectation that if Russia did decide to invade Ukraine, that it would succeed. And furthermore, that it might not stop at Ukraine. There was a lot of concern within Moldova, which is uh, just to the west of Ukraine. Uh, people even considered, uh, I believe some people actually did flee Moldova out of concern that they would come under Russian occupation. Uh, Russia has for many years had uh, a military presence in uh, the Transnistria region. I, I might not be pronouncing that correctly in, in eastern Moldova. Or moving across the entire country. Perhaps the most worrisome possibility was that Russia might make a play for the Suwalki Gap. Now, the Suwalki Gap is a region on the border between Poland and Lithuania. And it's of uh, high significance because it is the land bridge between um, uh, to, to get to Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad is a territory of the Russian Federation that has no geographic connection to uh, Russia. And so the, uh, the Suwaki Gap area would give it, I believe it's actually through, um, it, it borders Belarus and not Russia, but uh, there was concern that uh, Russia might make a play for this, the Suwaki Gap and that would you know, give it better access to Kaliningrad, which is its own territory. The major concern there is that this being on the border of Poland and Lithuania, this is NATO territory, and any um, uh, invasion of NATO territory would be a much more uh, dangerous situation than what we find ourselves in right now. And that could, that would, in, in all likelihood, invoke Article 5 of the, the NATO agreement in which an attack on any one country is an attack on all of them. And it would mobilize the, the rest of the NATO countries, including the United States, to enter into direct conflict against the Russian Federation. Now, would Russia have actually made a move for Moldova or the Suwalki Gap or, or any other territory beyond Ukraine? It looks like we will never know because, in fact, what transpired is Ukraine did not uh, did not uh, collapse as many had expected. Instead, they fought back and with uh, tremendous success. When the invasion began, it was clear that this was a large scale invasion, pursuing the um, pursuing it would appear domination of, if not the entire country, at least a large portion of it, including the capital Kiev. Indeed, it was widely suspected that uh, Russia would look to remove from power the current Ukrainian government and perhaps even reinstall uh, former President Viktor Yanukovych, who has uh, been in exile in Russia since his uh, the end of his, his term as president of Ukraine. But Ukraine has fought back, has fought back very uh, successfully. Russia abandoned its attempts to capture Kyiv and has since then uh, focused on uh, territory in eastern and, and southeastern Ukraine, the Donbass region and, and other regions um, between Russian territory and, and uh, Crimea, uh, that part of the country. And that's what has been going on roughly since around the, the summer. Uh, over the summer, it was essentially a war of attrition in which there was largely a stalemate. And this is, uh, you know, the war even maybe fell out of the news a little bit over the summer when the changes on the battlefield were relatively few. 
But uh, starting in September, just about a month and a half ago, Ukraine began a counteroffensive that has had uh, a fair bit of success recapturing a modest portion of the territory that Russia had uh, conquered uh, since the invasion began in February of this year. And as it uh, has done that, that has increased the pressure on Russia because it has now uh, raised the suggestion that they might just lose, that Russia might lose all of the territory that it has conquered. And in the extreme case, uh, Ukraine could conceivably even push into Crimea and retake Crimea, which the international community for the most part continues to recognize as being legitimately uh, part of the country of Ukraine and not the country of Russia. And that has created a very nervous situation which is the situation that we are living through at this moment. And there are a, a lot of concerns that the current situation could end in nuclear war. And uh, I should walk through some of the, the details of that. Let me first say that we don't know how this is going to end out. Uh, will there be a nuclear war? Anybody who makes a definitive prediction on this that's, uh, that's not a voice that we should uh, take very seriously. There's too many moving parts, too many variables, too many things that could go in different directions. And furthermore, the decision to use nuclear weapons would primarily be the decision of uh, the Russian leadership, in particular Vladimir Putin, and uh, who knows what's going on inside his mind and how he would respond to certain situations. I would expect that he himself doesn't know at this point uh, exactly when he would or, or would not use nuclear weapons. It does seem clear that that's not his preference. Uh, there's, it, it, I mean, his preference presumably would have been to just win in Ukraine without having to fight much at all. Uh, that that much would seem to be clear. Uh, and he would presumably prefer to achieve all of his goals without using nuclear weapons. He's had plenty of opportunities to use nuclear weapons throughout the conflict and has decided not to do so despite issuing numerous threats or, or suggestions of, of the possibility of using nuclear weapons. That said, we're not out of this yet. And a major concern is that if Ukraine continues to win on the battlefield and, and there are uh, there's plenty of reason to believe that they may continue to do so, that that may put pressure on Russia to use its nuclear weapons uh, because they are so heavily invested in this conflict uh, in terms of the portion of their military that they have committed to this and in terms of the domestic toll that they've uh, taken from this through uh, sanctions by the international community, loss of standing uh, within the international community, uh, things of that sort, for them to have done all of this for nothing, that would be a, a significant you know, loss from their perspective. Uh, they, they would have um, you know, done so much and, and lost so much with so much sacrifice to do all of that and come away with nothing, that's a really difficult situation to be in. And so it's possible that if Ukraine continues its success on the battlefield, that Russia will continue to escalate in dangerous ways. Now, they may have options available to escalate before turning to nuclear weapons. Uh, that could even include the use of other unconventional weapons, like chemical weapons, for example. But uh, I think it's unlikely that something like chemical weapons would change the, the course of the battlefield either. And so perhaps they may find themselves in a situation in which using nuclear weapons would be a plausible option to pursue. And in this context, it's worth a note about Russian domestic politics, because for years, Putin has had a very strong command on power within the Russian Federation. There are hints that that may be cracking, 
that this war may be going uh, disastrously wrong, not just for the world and, and especially for Ukraine, but also for uh, for Putin and his hold on power, that he personally has invested a lot in this war to a very large extent. This appears to be a war that he personally made the decision to pursue, and it was not a, a war of necessity and may not have uh, wide, deep widespread support within either the Russian population or the Russian elites. They may just, for the most part, be going along with um, with Putin to the extent that it it's reasonable to do so. Now, this is all very speculative. I can't say that I I personally have chatted with the Russian elites in, in private to get their opinions on this. Um, we we don't know for sure one way or another, but it is reasonable to suppose that in the event that the war goes poorly, that uh, maybe rival factions within Russia could make a play for the Kremlin, or uh, there could be much more in the way of uh, popular uprisings within the Russian population that there have been. We have seen an increase in, in protests and so on, especially with the recent decision by Russia to issue a partial mobilization in which um, uh, people from around Russia are uh, conscripted into the Russian army in order to be sent to Ukraine to fight that is a decision that it appears Russia uh, has avoided because they know that it's a politically sensitive thing to do. And indeed, it has proven to be politically contentious. This uh, may further weaken uh, uh, Putin's domestic political position. And it is not hard to imagine that if Putin is staring down a situation in which he faces defeat on the battlefield in Ukraine, and potentially also loss of his own political power uh, within Russia, and in the extreme case, may even fear for his own life, that under that situation, taking a gamble on a nuclear attack may actually seem like the best course of action from his perspective, and it's his decision that, that matters on this. It must be stressed that a nuclear attack is unlikely to achieve significant uh, advantage on the battlefield. A nuclear attack on a, a rival military is especially useful when the military has a lot of power concentrated in one geographic area that can then be bombed. In contrast, Ukraine's military is highly decentralized. And so uh, a nuclear attack is really not the, the right way to, to take it out. Um, and Another option would be instead of uh, targeting the Ukrainian military, they could target the Ukrainian population. They could uh, bomb the city. And indeed, we have seen throughout the war extensive attacks on civilian populations, uh, really just deep and horrible atrocities. And so it, it, it is uh, plausible that instead of targeting the Ukrainian military, they would instead target a city. It could be Kyiv. It could be a different city. We, we don't know. And the, the purpose there would be to try to uh, terrify the Ukraine, Ukrainians and, and the international community about what could come next in order to persuade it to end, um, end its military operations and give Russia some sort of victory. We should hope that it does not come to that because it, there's a very high likelihood that if there was a nuclear attack, there would be some sort of response, not just from Ukraine, but perhaps also from NATO and, and other uh, uh, members of the international community. And the biggest concern for the world is that if one nuclear weapon is used, then more than one gets used. Russia has the world's largest nuclear arsenal. The United States has a nuclear arsenal that's not that much, uh, not that much smaller if all of those nuclear weapons are used, then that poses a major, major threat, not just to uh, NATO and, and Russia and Ukraine, but to the entire world through um, effects like nuclear winter. So uh, people anywhere around the world could face, um, could face famine, could face economic collapse, could face major, major uh, difficulties in the event of a large scale nuclear war. 
a small scale nuclear war would not pose the same sort of threat if one nuclear weapon is used, then people in other parts of the world will be able to you know, carry on with their lives more or less. But we don't know if it would stop at one. And so the best place to stop it is that not having any nuclear weapons used in the first place. That's by far the safest way to go. And, and this much is, is unambiguous. And so that raises the question of what can reasonably be done to reduce this risk. Um, and before saying that, I, I, to briefly note, a lot of the conversation that I have been part of uh, regarding the war has concerned the probability of uh, nuclear war uh, coming from, from the ongoing conflict. And my own view on this is that in principle, it is possible to quantify the probability of the nuclear war. I would say it's possible to quantify any probability, but I'm not offering my own number or numbers plural for this. And I don't think that's what we should be focusing on. There are a lot of different uh, estimates that are out there, including by people who, well, some of them are more well-informed than others. Some of them are better at doing probability estimation than others. But the bottom line is that even if it's a fairly low probability, the stakes are so high that this is clearly a risk that should be reduced. And so my focus is not on trying to come up with a reasonable number for what the probability may be. My focus is on whatever it is, let's reduce it. And how can we go about reducing it? So three specific points for uh, regarding how to reduce the risk. First, international condemnation of any uh, nuclear weapons use. The more pressure there is from the international community against any nuclear attack, the less likely it is that there would be one. What's clear is that Russia values its standing within the international community at uh, various points uh, throughout the war. Uh, Russia, and especially Putin, has tried to frame this not just as a regional European struggle, but as a global struggle against American hegemony, against a, a you know, unipolar American-led world order, uh, against European colonialism and things like that, which is you know, terribly ironic because Russia itself is engaging in colonialism right now with its attempt to dominate Ukraine and force it to bend to its will. The countries that are most influential are those that continue to have some uh, friendly relation with Russia. China and India stand out as, as the most significant in this regard. But um, all countries, especially those who have remained relatively neutral uh, during the conflict, also have considerable sway. And these are countries across other parts of Asia, certainly across uh, pretty much all of Africa, Latin America, these parts of the world hold considerable influence. And so for uh, those of you in the audience, if you are from any of these countries, to the extent that you have opportunities to uh, persuade your own national government to speak out either publicly or privately, uh, preferably both, against any nuclear weapons use, um, and especially to convey this message to Russia, that is a fantastic thing to do to reduce the, the risk. You can do this by reaching out to government officials, especially diplomats you may know, uh, get them thinking about this, get them uh, trying to take action. You can do this by contributing to uh, public conversations about it, by contributing to, to media outlets, even social media, especially if you are able to generate attention from people who are involved in these sorts of policy conversations. For myself, I uh, started tweeting about these things using my Twitter account, and um, you know that generated some attention that that has um, has been helpful. And so the the barriers to entry on this uh, don't have to be very high. And so I would encourage anybody who uh, feels like they may have opportunities along these lines to pursue that. The other point about uh, pursuing condemnation of uh, any nuclear weapons use is that there really isn't much in the way of downside. 
Uh, this is something that, to the extent that there is downside, it might be, say, countries being reluctant to uh, use up their political capital with Russia or maybe put themselves in a, a more difficult economic situation because they have an economic partnership with Russia. And that's completely understandable. And this is why, or this is a reason why some countries have been reluctant to push back against Russia and its activities in Ukraine. But this is serious. A nuclear war is in no country's interest. It's terrible for the whole world and, and it has just very massive implications. And so this is one to maybe consider using up some of that capital on. Um, and so that that would be that would be my number one suggestion for for this audience is to try getting involved in that. Uh, the second one, and this is one that I actually am much more ambiguous on and, and indeed I'm very skeptical on, there are a lot of proposals out there that essentially amount to land for peace, that uh, Ukraine and the international community let Russia keep some of its territory, starting with Ukraine and maybe, maybe also some additional territory in exchange for a ceasefire agreement. And... Um, uh, winding the conflict down so that we can uh, get out of this nuclear crisis that we find ourselves in. And the reason I'm skeptical of that is because I don't trust Russia. If there's one thing we can say with confidence about Russia is that they are epically untrustworthy. Uh, and I guess the second thing is that their ambitions have already shown themselves to be quite large. This land for peace idea, that's essentially what we did with Crimea in 2014, where there was no major war and the cloud of nuclear war uh, did hang over uh, Crimea in 2014 as well. There wasn't any significant pushback, and here we are. Indeed, the fact that there has been pushback at this time may have prevented Russia from trying to annex the Suwalki Gap, NATO territory, in which case we would be in uh, an even larger nuclear crisis than we find ourselves in right now. And so I'm, I'm much more skeptical about these land for peace ideas that are, are floating around. And the final one, this is also a bit more of a, a long-term uh, approach, is to try to pursue friendlier relations with Russia. Now, this might sound kind of crazy because uh, Russia is uh, committing a war of aggression against another country. It is committing uh, massive atrocities within that country. The thought of trying to become friends with them is perhaps a bit odd, but over the long term, this is the only way to reliably keep the risk of nuclear war low, because maybe we make it out of this crisis without a nuclear war, but unless there are friendlier relations, we're probably just gonna have another crisis sometime down the road and another one some other time. And eventually maybe we're not so lucky to, to get out of it. Furthermore, for the immediate crisis, the more we can emphasize to Russia that if it changes its behavior in a friendlier direction, that a brighter future awaits for it, that there is a pathway back to becoming a member of the international community in good standing. It might not be an easy path, but there should be a path. There should be a brighter future ahead. And we should be prepared to reward Russia for any good behavior that, that it pursues because we can't just wish away Russia. You know, compared to World War, the end of World War II with Japan and Germany, both of those countries were conquered. You know, at one point in time, Japan and Germany were, they, they were the adversaries, at least of my country, the United States. Now they're allies. The thought of having a major war against Japan and Germany, it's just like that silliness. It doesn't make any sense. We're friends with them. We get along great. You know, we, we help each other out on things. And could we get to the same point with Russia? It would be more difficult because we can't conquer Russia because of its nuclear arsenal. That would be suicide. That is the one circumstance in which we should assume Russia would use its nuclear weapons if we tried to conquer the country. So that's off the table, but nonetheless, we have to try pursuing friendlier relations because otherwise we're just gonna keep finding ourselves into it. It's not easy. It, we should not blind ourselves to the utterly horrible situation that we find ourselves in right now, which we can for the most part pin on Russia, but 
uh, that is something that um, uh, that we should be looking to the future for. And I'll close on this, which is uh, just a general message for effective altruism, and the study of global catastrophic risk, existential risk, and things like that, which is that with respect to how to actually reduce the risk in practice, a lot of it comes down to much more practical details, such as the details that I've been discussing throughout my remarks, as opposed to more theoretical matters related to the long-term future, related to the uh, effects of nuclear winter on the viability of human civilization, things of that sort. Those, those things do all matter, and they can motivate attention to nuclear war in the first place. But in a, especially in a crisis like this, where it's clearly the, the best option is to just avoid any nuclear weapons use in the first place, how to achieve that is primarily contingent on these sorts of geopolitical details that uh, are honestly fairly removed from discussions of, of catastrophic risk in the long-term future and, and so on. And so uh, for those who are interested in trying to help out in reducing nuclear war risk, and, and you know, the same idea applies to a lot of other risks as well, I would encourage you to be engaged in the, the broader conversations and, and the, the broader issues that are related to the risk, because often that's where the opportunities lie for how to, in, in practice, actually reduce the risk. And I'll stop there. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Seth, for that very interesting talk. I already see we have a lot of questions um, coming in. So just to organize the discussion a little bit, um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put it in the questions tab. If there are any comments or discussion points you'd like to bring up or you'd like me to raise to Seth, feel free to also put it in the, in the questions tab because that's what I'm going to be referring to for a majority of this session. OK, so let's start with our first question, um, which is, what is a strategy that can be done with the Russian nuclear arsenal in case the current Russian regime collapses? Well, that's a good question. There are scenarios in which the Russian regime collapses and also the Russian Federation collapses. So Russia is a federation. The different uh, regions within Russia have not always the strongest ties with the national government. There are scenarios in which actually the country as a whole breaks up and that poses uh, particularly strong challenges for the nuclear arsenal because it is uh, scattered geographically across the country. And so we may find situations in which there is a scramble to account for all of the nuclear weapons. Now, in other scenarios in which there is a change of government, but the country as a whole stays intact, uh, and that's also, I should say, entirely possible. There's no guarantee that the country would break up. I don't even want to comment on how likely that is. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I can say this feels like it would be a nervous moment. One thing we want with nuclear weapons is stability and continued responsible governance of the weapons themselves. We don't want volatile situations with the command and control of nuclear weapons. And so it's possible that any change in the Russian government would end up um, making, uh, making the nuclear war risk lower, that we would end up with safer, more responsible government, but there's no guarantee. It would be a, it would be a nervous moment is the bottom line. Hmm. Okay, yeah, that's a really interesting response that there is a hope, but it's, like you said, not a guarantee for sure. And um, so we have a question about the use then of the nuclear weapons. So one element of Ukraine's strategic value is the fertility of its soil. So what is the political gain of Russia to use nuclear weapons if it makes the land they seized unusable? Oh, that's a good question. How unusable would it be? It may not be unusable forever. This is actually a, a technical detail that I don't have the answer to off the top of my head. I apologize. But we can see, for example, if you go to Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan right now, they're cities again. They've they've been rebuilt. Um, you can you can go visit them. Uh, you can go you know, look at pictures of them on the internet and videos and so on. They've been rebuilt. 
Uh, what about the uh, agricultural territory around it? You'd probably look that up too. If I had to guess, um, it wouldn't eliminate agriculture in Ukraine, especially because uh, you would need to use a lot of nuclear weapons to really plaster the entire territory. Ukraine's not that small of a country, and uh, the nuclear weapons they don't spread radiation over that much territory is my understanding. For example, we still do have agriculture in Japan. Um, and so my expectation is that the effect would be limited, though I can't say with certainty. That's not one that I've, I've personally looked at. It's a good question, though. Mm, yeah, I definitely agree. And so, I mean, if they do decide to use nuclear weapons, I, maybe that'd be something that they would consider. And maybe they would think that, you know, that's not something that would be a priority when when they end up, if they end up using it. Right. Um, so there's another question about has the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the international response changed your personal estimate of the cumulative existential risk until 2100? And if so, how? I know you said you didn't have a specific number, sure. but maybe whether that would increase or decrease. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's certainly an increase just because the immediate situation poses a, a significant risk whatever the probability may be. It's clear to me that this is a nuclear crisis of historic proportion. Uh, people debate, is the risk from this larger than the risk may have been for, the, say, the Cuban Missile Crisis or events of 1983 or other incidents throughout history? That sort of comparison is difficult to make, especially because the dust is still settling on the current conflict and the current crisis, and there has no there hasn't been any historical scholarship of the current crisis. It's current. A lot of what we've learned about the Cuban Missile Crisis came years after the fact, and so that's a difficult comparison to make. But overall, it's clear, yes, this increases the, the cumulative uh, risk, um, however you look at it. Does it uh, increase it by a lot? That's one of those things that it's... Uh, I'm not prepared to make a, a significant claim about that at this time. What I will say is that this merits immediate attention just because this is such an acute, urgent crisis. And so I do think that this is worthy of people's time and attention um, right now. And hopefully we'll we'll find a way out of this. And um, at that point, you know, I personally would be you know, reallocating my own attention toward other situations other other risks. Hmm. Yeah. So with regard to the current conflict, what are some mechanisms then by which the conflict could escalate to the point where A, actors use nuclear weapons against Putin's side either in Russia or Ukraine, or B, Putin uses nuclear weapons against targets outside of Ukraine? Well, first of all, the countries that have nuclear weapons can use them at any time and for any reason. That's just the fundamental reality of the situation that you know, if if Russia wants to launch its nuclear weapons against, uh, you know, uh, Peru and Venezuela tomorrow, it can do that. That's one of the options that it has. Why would it do that? I have no idea. It doesn't make any sense. And presumably uh, the odds of that happening are sufficiently low that, you know, it's not worth talking about except as, you know, a hypothetical thought experiment, if you will. But the range of possible scenarios is essentially infinite. Um, what is likely to happen is beyond the scenario, uh, uh, sort of scenarios that I outlined in my remarks regarding the um, uh, possibility of a nuclear attack on Ukraine in which Russia is uh, struggling on the battlefield. The one other to add is that it might not be an attack on Ukraine. It could even be an attack on NATO, something that uh, sometimes gets lost in the shuffle a little bit is that Russia's nuclear threats have to a large extent been addressed to NATO and to the international community and not to Ukraine. It seems insane to initiate a nuclear attack against NATO, but I wouldn't rule it out. Hmm. Okay. So, and you know, you did mention earlier a little bit about um, creating friendlier relations. So in trying to create these friendlier relations, how do you toe the line between 
holding its citizens accountable and trying to treat them empathetically. I think we need to do both at the same time that Russia needs to understand that its actions are uh, you know, beyond the pale or, or unacceptable. At the same time, if it changes its actions, then uh, uh, there is a pathway for it back to being a member of the international community in good standing. I am very uncomfortable arguing against uh, Ukraine continuing to, to uh, fight on the battlefield and trying to, to retake its territory. I'm very uncomfortable with that idea. But uh, the idea that Russia is inherently the enemy and can never be uh, on friendly terms with the West or with other, other parts of the international community, I think we really need to reject it. We've seen countries change before. Japan and Germany are great examples. Uh, that needs to be in the cards. And so I think we need a mix of carrots and sticks of, of you know, punishments for bad action, reward for good action. Sometimes it, it can be that simple. Um, and hopefully Russia will get the message and will uh, move in a friendlier direction. Hmm. Okay, so we did talk a little bit about um, earlier about uh, there being a little ray of hope in terms of you know, whether there will be a regime change. So there's a question about what are the chances for regime change with someone a lot friendlier than Putin taking over through elections or through a coup? Should we try to support the Russian opposition, politicians or activists, um, independent Russian media to make that more likely? I do not think there should be significant international support for uh, Russian opposition because this is a uh, who succeeds Putin and Putin, he's 70 years old, he's not going to last forever, um, whether you know he, he dies in office or, or is removed uh, through elections or anything else. That's for the Russians to decide. And the if the international community is seen as trying to push Putin out of power, then that gives him that much more reason to try to strike back that I would say increases the, the risk of nuclear war. And so, first of all, it just should be their decision. It's their country, and, and that should be emphasized. Um, what are the odds of it going in a friendlier direction? I don't have a good read of that. Uh, it really could go either way. But what I do feel is that to the extent that the international international community can really commit to the message that if Russia behaves more responsibly, a brighter future awaits for it, then Hopefully that message can be heard by people across Russia, from the public, from the elites, um, from whoever is going to be involved in making this succession decision. And hopefully that will nudge them in a friendlier direction as the succession eventually, one way or another, occurs. Mm. Okay, so we talk about the international community. What about, um, there's a question about Russians themselves. What best can be done by Russians, mostly outside of the country, because while being in Russia, it is dangerous to follow any anti-war activities. Also, I'm mindful of the time, so we'll just take maybe one or two more questions. Okay, sure. Um, for uh, those who have access to um, conversations within Russia, and that could be, uh, people in Russia right now, that could be Russians who have uh, left the country, could be other people who you know, just have, have ties to people in Russia. Um, I would try to help people stay informed. Uh, there is a, a mixed information, domestic information environment within Russia um, to try and help them stay informed and to help promote the idea that, uh, it's in Russia's interest to pursue a friendlier future. Now, that has to be matched by the international community. That ha It has to actually be true that there is a better future in store for Russia if it pursues a friendlier direction. The international community needs to send that message and people within Russia need to receive it. And so that's something that I would be working toward um, uh, for anyone who has access to uh, you know, people in Russia, whether it's the general public or or elites, either way, that's the sort of message that I would be spreading. 
Okay, so we'll just do one more question. Um, and then for all the other questions, feel free to attend Seth's office hours right after this, if you want to ask your question or continue any other discussions with him. Um, so the last question is, what do you think of the practice of making quantified forecasts for catastrophes like nuclear war? And how much credence would you personally put on these? It's a good question. So uh, there can be a role for this, especially if they are done well. Uh, there are people who are trained in forecasting, have some skill in this. My understanding is that it's a matter of debate, the extent to which uh, the skill in more uh, you know, typical day-to-day -day forecasting translates to these sorts of uh, rare and extreme uh, events. But uh, I don't make much of it because to me, the part to really embrace is the details of how to reduce the risk and forecasting and, and having the quantitative numbers for the probabilities and all of that stuff often plays a relatively small role in what to actually do about it. And so I personally invest less of my energy in trying to nail down really good numbers and instead invest my energy more in trying to have what's often a more qualitative understanding of the specific practical actions that can actually be done to reduce the risk. Yeah, I definitely, you know, agree with that. Like knowing what is the way forward then, you know, from this point on, I think that's very, um, yeah, that's a very relevant, important point. So those are all the questions that we'll be taking for this session. If anyone has any more questions, um, like I mentioned, feel free to ask Seth during his office hours right after this. You'll find the Zoom link for that on the event page. In the meantime, thank you so much, Seth, for a very interesting talk and Q&A session. And thank you everyone for attending. I hope all of you have a great rest of your conference. Thank you.